Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, everybody. So, um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I hope you'll have an inspiring week. Um, we are here at the 31st International Conference, uh, 31 years since the first one, and we are here in many ways to celebrate calligraphy. And this is a chance for me to use, to recycle this catalog design from an exhibition last year. But this talk is not about my work, this talk is about your work and our work together. Um, 31 years since the first conference, many of the uh, students then have gone on to become well-known teachers. Um, this is actually even slightly before the first conference in 1979. Herman Zaff is the master, Julian Waters is one of the students. Um, an interesting photo, Julian sent me this. Um, everyone's focused on Herman Zaff's hands and what he's showing them, but Julian's looking right into his eye, <laughs> looking a little deeper, looking, you know, he's got his arms folded in total respect, uh, Julian has told me. He, I asked him for another publication if I could say he used to be Herman Zaff's protege, and he says, no, I still am. But he's clearly got a vision in his eye there, and he's here this week as long, uh, along with uh, the rest of us. Um, so the message in these first couple of photos is, um, We've all been students too, don't be afraid to engage with us. You want to have an engaging teacher, teachers like to have engaging students. Here was an engaging student. There's three well-known calligraphers here now. This photograph, I'm not sure, maybe in the 80s sometimes. Uh, the master is the one being pointed at by the student, uh, Friedrich Neugebauer from Austria, visiting San Francisco. The translator at the workshop is Alan Blackman on the left, and Georgia Deaver, is uh, asking him a polite question. <laughs> so Georgia sent me this photo. Georgia is not teaching in this conference, but she's uh, been in, uh, an inspiration to me and others uh, for many years, and she's taught at some conferences. Um, I asked her what was going on here, and she says, oh, I don't know, Dennis, but I'm sure I was raising hell. <laughs> And I thought, you know, look at the eye contact there, it's, it's engaging. Um, what, what were they thinking about? What were they talking about? And I asked Georgia, could she remember the context? And she couldn't, but she emailed Alan Blackman, and Alan ba Blackman emailed back, and I got forwarded the email, and his answer was a load of baloney. He made it up and mixed it within some truth. Um, we are all creative people, so I thought I'll make up my own baloney to go with this photograph. Because I'm look, look at the, the uh, there's calligraphy on the wall behind the heads of these people. It, it's almost like cartoon balloons, you know. That's what they're saying. Alan Blackman is saying, I am so unhappy with you, Georgia, to question the great master who's come from Austria. There's a smile on Friedrich Neugebauer's face. But he's also saying, I'm so unhappy that I don't speak English. I can't, I can't understand this engaging conversation. George's balloon is all blurred. <laughs> we have to make that one up. She's pointing. Look at those dots on the collar of... She's saying, I'm a decorative person. Come on, Alan, let's put a few more dots on him. He looks good. <laughs> let's join the dots. So that's uh, the light-hearted side, you know, you, you can enjoy these classes not just for inspiration but for a bit of fun as well. <laughs> but this is actually a piece of work from Georgia Deaver from her earlier days and I think this was 1985. It was a particular piece that I saw reproduced in the very first issue of the very first Guild magazine I got. When I was 16 years old, I was commissioned to do a gospel book for my calligraphy teacher and as a bonus payment, he signed me up for, uh, as a lay member to the Society of Scribes and Illuminators, and this was on the, in the, color, in the center spread. Sheila Waters' Round Love the Seasons was there, and it, it was inspiring, you know, and George's work here to see these amazing free flourishes combined with more traditional work was, was great. George has been doing uh, professional work for many years. This is another one of her simpler early commissions, um, one of her simpler jobs wedding invitations. 
Um, of all the jobs she's done, this is maybe less flourished. Uh, but this is a kind of special job because it was for another jobs. Steve Jobs' wedding invitations were done by Georgia Deaver in 1991. Um, everyone written by hand, put in a handmade envelope. And I'm making a link here, because we are here in Reed College. There's a legacy of calligraphy which has already been spoken about. Steve Jobs studied calligraphy here and stayed on for months after dropping out of college. Steve Jobs, uh, the inventor of the Macintosh computer, CEO of Apple and Pixar, who died last year. He learned calligraphy here, where you are going to be engaging with calligraphy. Um, I'll let him talk about it in a short video. Reed College at that time offered perhaps the best calligraphy instruction in the country. Throughout the campus, every poster, every label on every drawer was beautifully hand calligraphed. Because I had dropped out and didn't have to take the normal classes, I decided to take a calligraphy class to learn how to do this. I learned about serif and sans serif typefaces, about varying the amount of space between different letter combinations, about what makes great typography great. It was beautiful, historical, artistically subtle in a way that science can't capture, and I found it fascinating. None of this had even a hope of any practical application in my life. But 10 years later, when we were designing the first Macintosh computer, it all came back to me. And we designed it all in the Mac. It was the first computer with beautiful typography. If I had never dropped in on that single course in college, the Mac would have never had multiple typefaces with proportionally safe fonts. And since Windows just copied the Mac, it's likely that no person in the computer would have it. So, who knows? Uh, yes, he stayed on for several months after dropping out, sleeping on friends' bedroom floors. Who knows? Steve Jobs could have slept on the floor of the bedroom you were sleeping in. <laughs> he took Reed College so seriously, not because of academic studies, that he named his son Reed. Don't ask how I got this personal message from Steve Jobs, but it's quite a touching message if you read the, the, the words. Um, as you most likely know, he died of cancer last year. He did get to see his son, Reed, graduate. This is the man who's taught uh, Steve Jobs and many, many others uh, calligraphy here at Reed College. Um, since 1969, he took over the job of Lloyd Reynolds, who is the, as you know now, was the man who started it all here. Now, I'd heard of Lloyd Reynolds when I was a student back in England, but was ne I never really connected with what an important man he was until I visited Portland and got to hang around with people who knew him. Because clearly he was, uh, calligraphy was not the end of it. Calligraphy was merely the departure point, it seems, for a man like Lloyd Reynolds. He seems to have been a humanist. Um, it's not the calligraphy, it's what the calligraphy is for. What is the calligraphy for? He wrote it here, calligraphy for people, and people are more important than the calligraphy in the way he's written it. Um, what are you going to do with the calligraphy you learn to make? What is it for? Oh, Lloyd Reynolds was also a master of doing serifs without looking at the paper. <laughs> Um, this is actually a photograph of the dance teacher at uh, Reed College in the 60s, um, Jenny Hunter Grote, who is an octogenarian now, but she still likes to, to, to say she dances on paper. Um, she calls herself an abstract expressionist painter more than a calligrapher these days, but she connected with calligraphy through Lloyd Reynolds' classes. And uh, I've never met Lloyd Reynolds, but I've met people like... Uh, Mary Taylor and Carol, who've told me stories, and I haven't even met Jenny Hunter Grope, but we've had long Facebook discussions. Um, this is a magazine design I did to introduce her work uh, to an English calligraphy guild. Um, her painting on the left, my job was to unify it with uh, the image, it's an early image of her dance in uh, the 50s, I think, um, on the right. The only mark I've made on the page is the question mark, bottom right. 
Um, it's clear I needed to integrate the black and white with the red and purple, so this was just a piece of artwork I happened to have on file, and I brought it in there. But it's not just about the design uh, of the colors. Um, the shape of that mark is paraphrasing the shape of the gesture in the dance. See the clockwise movement around, then down. Um, Jenny was impressed that I picked up on that, but not just that. If you look closely into the painting, almost, well, I won't say all, but many of the brush strokes are actually repetitions of that upwards around and then down. If you look at this painting closely, it's clear this is the work of a right-handed person. Um, Left-handed calligraphers tend to still follow the right-handed way. I think if I was a left-handed calligrapher, I'd have to reinvent a new calligraphy. But uh, abstract painters don't have that hang-up. I'm sure an abstract painter, if was making these gestures, they'd come from the spine outwards and around and back to the body, which is, uh, shows this is a right-handed mark making. And Jenny was fascinated with the depths of way, the way I was looking at just designing these things. As a dancer, she knew about gesture. And she, she claims that it was Lloyd Reynolds who found the connection for her between dance and calligraphy. She told me, she tells her students, or told her students in calligraphy, uh, about writing letters. Write it with your whole body. Write it with your toenails. And you can see in this image uh, how active her toes are in, the, the, in this, which is uh, quite a part of the gesture. So how does this type of person connect with uh, Steve Jobs again, a man of technology, a man of business, a man of the digital world. <laughs> so I already told you they, they have that connection uh, in calli calligraphy classes here in Reed College. Um, but there's more connections, you know, and I have another little video featuring a story from Steve Jobs. Uh, which will show you that maybe the digital world isn't so far away from the artistic world. In 1984, they visited the home of Yoko Ono for the ninth birthday party of Sean, her son with John Lennon. Jobs took along a birthday gift that fascinated not only Sean, but the whole star-studded guest list. Steve so opened it up, pulled it out, you know, what was one of those first Macintoshes off the assembly line. Set it up on the floor. Sean was down on the floor with him. Steve turned it on, put back paint in there. It took him about two seconds to show Sean how to deal with it. And Sean pretty soon was drawing pictures. Later, Steve told me it's one of the first times he'd watched a child with a Mac. Eventually, I sort of became aware that there were some people you know, who would come into the room, and I looked over my shoulder, and there was Andy Warhol. So there was this great moment that uh, I'll never forget. You know, Andy Warhol gets down on his hands and knees with Sean on one side and Steve on the other side. I remember that Warhol would pick up the mouse and you know, instead of lining it along the floor, you know, the tile floor in Sean's bedroom, he would sort of pick it up and was trying to figure out how to make it work. And Steve very patiently would sort of lower his hand down and you know, push it along. So Andy sort of fooled around with it and he was completely mesmerized. I mean, when he zoned in on something, the rest of the world disappeared. And that was what it was like watching Warhol in front of Macintosh for the first time. And then, you know, he got this big smile on his face and he looked up and said, I drew a circle. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought that was just a sweet story about, you know, computers are digital things, but, you know, they engage human beings. Um, and they certainly helped develop my calligraphy. It's technology, you know. Here is a man 30,000 years ago reaching forward to make his mark using the technology he could think of at the time. 30,000 years he's managed to communicate his spirit through gesture, reaching out to make his mark. The technology here seems to have been blowing pigment through a straw. You know, learn to not to suck is the, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a close up of my left thumb, digitum. The Latin for finger is digit. That's how we have the word digital. I guess the link is Roman numerals, numbers which are signed by hand, one. Two fingers, two. A V for five, maybe a whole hand like this. The X for 10, maybe a gesture like this. Um, this is a photograph of my hands with calligraphy written by those hands projected back on those hands. 
digital projections onto my digits. For me, calligraphy is about playing with words. You know, my father was always the, visually, uh, the visual artist of the family, but my mother, well, she was Irish Scrabble champion a couple of times. She always liked word games. A manual, it's a book. Manus is the Latin for the word hand. Manual and digital are so connected in that sense. Uh, computers are binary, of course, we are pentadactyles, five digit beings. Um, and this is an illuminated manuscript. If it wasn't for the projected light, you wouldn't see anything. And the image has been digitally edited. So a handwritten calligraphy being taken into the digital world and the actual prints are on hand painted paper. Here is another digital image with uh, a human connection. This is a photograph taken after the uh, Fukushima uh, nuclear disaster in Japan, northeast Japan, last March. And here we can see two people who are very connected through this disaster. Two very different beings. The soldier very connected with uh, a sense of purpose at that moment. And the man in a situation of chaos, he is calm. And he's got cool shoes, he's saying, I'm really glad I got these shoes, you know, there's photographers about. Um, calligraphy is about rhythm, repet patterns of repetition. Nature is full of rhythm and full of life. Sometimes it's dangerous, sometimes it's dangerous, always it's beautiful. Um, the Fukushima disaster again, there's some amazing photographs I, I, I found, um, like this one, patterns of repetition which caused chaos. There is a link here, but I'll come back to it. Um, you might notice there are some spiral images in the top left here that have a similar pattern, but I'm showing you this as a changing theme a little bit before I come back. Um, this is a close-up of an Irish manuscript made in Switzerland, in St. Gaul, where there's an Irish monastery, uh, in the ninth century. But this particular manuscript is not most remarkable for its illumination. Its illumination is fine and interesting, and so is its script. But the scribe of this manuscript reached out to make his mark in a different way. He wrote notes in the margins. He did things, he wrote texts he wasn't asked to write. He made up poems and wrote them in the margins. In the ninth century, okay, you've got his main text in the lower lines, the one right next to the top margin um, is his marginal note, our marginal poem. I'm going to read it out to you in Irish, because it's in Irish. Is acher in go in ocht fu fusna firge fiend holt neogore mora min don de lechred line u lochland. Lochland, the north lands. This is a poem about Viking invasions. The remarkable thing, I'll read it to you in English actually. Bitter and wild is the wind tonight, tossing the tresses of the sea to white. On such a night as this, I feel at ease. Fierce Northmen only course the quiet seas. I've connected with this text early on, as you can see. Um, I didn't even know it at the time, but I think it was a response to being bullied as a schoolchild for me. And I've made a connection more recently with the most remarkable of Irish manuscripts, the Book of Kells, one of the remarkable things for me about this manuscript is it's so calm, full of energy, but full of peace, yet made in a time of chaos. Uh, the island of Iona was attacked by Vikings several times, and the monks fled back to the mothership of a place called Kells, which is uh, in the County Meath in Ireland. Gemma Black is going to be talking about the Book of Kells, uh, an introduction on Tuesday evening, so I will skip on to, actually this is a detail of a work which is very similar to the one I have in the faculty show, which repeats this same poem. I've written it dozens of times before I started to figure out the personal interactions. Um, originally scribes are commissioned to write other people's texts, and I showed you this scribe in that manuscript cheated. He put his own words in there. He, be, he, be, he actually became creative with the words. Um, so here we have an image which has the different aspects, like that aspect of the inspiration from these horrific photographs from Fukushima and northeastern Japan, combined with that image of peace in the, in the, the Celtic spiral. What does calligraphy mean to you? 
I mentioned that Lloyd Reynolds quotation, he wrote, calligraphy for people. What are you going to do with your calligraphy? What have you got to say with it? It's important to think about this as much as you're practicing the forms and the shapes and the composition, the expression, the line. Um, we are here to celebrate calligraphy. I am here to go back through my slide. No, well, <laughs> I'm just finishing off now, people. It's OK. You get to go to bed soon. How you celebrate calligraphy may not be how I celebrate calligraphy. We're here to share. We are here to reach forward and make our mark. This is another photograph of me with my calligraphy projected. Thank you very much. Invite everyone to the social. Okay. I've been told to invite everybody to the social. It's in Mary Taylor's bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> or in the student union, you choose. <laughs> I can't find my room. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for being here, and please sleep well. Have in, come up refreshed in the morning and come play with us. Uh, I kept to my time as well. Better. That was phenomenal. Thank you. Absolutely. Let me just turn this off. Absolutely. Thank you.